Sacred Heart is proud to sponsor Pensacola Histories in recognition of the Daughters of Charity who brought their mission of care to Pensacola over 90 years ago. Hello and welcome to our continuing series of stories about Pensacola, North America's first place city. And, and in this story today, we'll be talking about one of the men who made a great difference in the evolution of Pensacola's business uh, back in the 1880s and 90s. And his name was William Dudley Chipley. Colonel Chipley was a, a Georgian. He was born in uh, what, what, at the area of Columbus, Georgia, the cotton area of Columbus, Georgia. And after his education at Transylvania University, he entered the Confederate Army, fought uh, in a number of battles, was wounded a couple of times, and uh, ultimately, uh, when he was discharged, he held the rank of colonel. Well, when the war ended, of course, the South was in disarray, and for a number of years, Chipley, uh, I think we'd have to say, moved back and forth in a rather undetermined direction. He went through a, an era, a period in which he became involved in a rather sordid scandal in his home state. Uh, he fin finally uh, managed to uh, come away from that, and at that point in time was employed by the, one of the emerging railroads in the, the state of Georgia. Now we have to remember that by the time we get into the early 1870s, uh, the South was slowly beginning to rebuild the railroad systems which had been so badly abused and in some cases destroyed uh, during and after the war. Uh, this was the case in Georgia and uh, Chipley uh, had got great experience doing this and then tying in for a brief time with, the brand, with a fairly new railroad that was uh, making, uh, making considerable progress, and that was the Baltimore and Ohio. And once he was uh, successful with them, he was uh, located by the, uh, the, L the emerging L&N system and they sent Mr. Chipley to, uh, to this area to become the general manager of what first was called the, the Pensacola and Louisville, uh, when, it, when that line was rebuilt in 1870 from downtown Pensacola up to, uh, to Flomanton Junction. And uh, the little, it changed names one or two, a couple of times. That, that's not part of our story really, but Chipley began working here in 1876 and did a lot to, to improve that line, which was, a, of course, becoming a vital link coming from the port of Pensacola up to, to link with the, the Mobile and Montgomery Railroad at, uh, at Flomaton. Well, Chipley, of course, had another, had another view. And uh, at this point in time, when we get toward the end of the 1870s, we had a, a rather unusual situation emerging in all of Florida. Uh, the Florida Internal Improvement Fund had gone into very serious troubles uh, sometimes earlier for reasons we are not part of our story here today. But by the time we get to, to just about 1880, the, the Improvement Fund was in a position where they could begin negotiating with railroad builders to provide an, a, an incentive, I guess that's the proper word for it, that where the state, along with some federal assistance, would give a, a building, a railroad builder, a, a building railroad, I guess is a better term, uh, so many acres of, of uh, Florida ground for every mile of track that they completed along a route which was deemed to be a, 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 an essential for the, for the state. Uh, there, there were a number, number of people uh, conf uh, uh, conflicting or, or uh, seeking uh, those, those grants from the state. Uh, Henry Plant, Henry Flagler, the railroad builders in the south and center of the state, and of course Chipley representing the LNN. And of course, by the time we get to 1880, the, the negotiations had been complete and the work was able to begin. And Chipley's work was to build a railroad from, uh, from the Pensacola docks to the Chattahoochee River, about 160 miles. At this point in time, that line would, be, would connect with another railroad being built out of Jacksonville to the west, so that we, when both were completed, we would have a route running from Pensacola to Jacksonville. Well, people looked at the at Chipley's plan, and uh, they had uh, serious questions about it, because now, number one, it was, while it wasn't a, a great length of distance that they were worried with, this, this uh, route was across bridges, uh, across uh, swamps and, uh, and all sorts of rivers and streams, things like the, the, the bay here at Pensacola, just huge uh, engineering challenges. And people said, well, they, they probably will never do it. Or if they do, it's gonna, it's gonna take forever. Well, Chipley, Chipley fooled them. He brought in great engineering talent and a lot of very able people. He was, being a, uh, he was working with, of course, a, a higher up in the uh, l &N system by the name of Fred DeFuniak. And they, they in turn laid out the route that would take them across the, across the area. And they assigned the actual construction 
to six different companies. And each, co each company had a specific segment of the route to build, uh, do the whole thing from start to finish. And these people were, had a, enough financial incentive that they went to work and did a, a wonderful job bringing in hundreds and hundreds of people. And surprisingly, that railroad was completed by mid-1882. It was functional. And we were able to, they were able to run trains from downtown across to the, uh, to the Chattahoochee. Uh, there are all sorts of stories about the ceremonies that Chipley had conducted when he did this because people in Pensacola were just just euphoric about this because today in, in the in the 21st century we I'm afraid many people do not appreciate how folks of the 1880s and 90s and beyond look toward railroads as the vital link to their prosperity and and the, the, their style of life and the, the completion of the new Pensacola Atlantic it was a, a a modern miracle for Pensacola well Chipley of course once they had the railroad built entered into a, a second phase because now they, the 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 P and A had received 23,000 acres of land for every mile that they completed. And that meant that overall they owned about 3 million acres between here and the Chattahoochee. And that's fine, that was fine back then, but there were no people. Uh, Little Milton was about the only village that we that existed in that uh, between Pensacola and the, and the Chattahoochee. And so Chipley and his, his lieutenants realized that unless they got, uh, they did some unique things, people, they, they had no traffic. And so uh, immediately they began to, to become Pens what I would call Pensacola's first great promoters. And they were. They, they, they produced all sorts of literature that, that illustrated uh, what could be done with this beautiful land here in Northwest Florida. They, they, I think they lied a little bit because they had pictures of fruits and vegetables which ostensibly were grown on this property here, which would uh, challenge the, the imagination and the mind. But they, they sent this liter literature all over and they attracted people, uh, people coming to take a look, perhaps to buy and invest. Another thing that they did, of course, early on was to create a, Pens a uh, Northwest Florida Chautauqua. They, uh, they, uh, they did this uh, right on the, ba on the banks of the little, uh, of the little lake that was the, was the formation point for the village of, of uh, Defuniac Springs. And the Chautauqua came into being there. And of course, they, they offered uh, wonderful uh, excursion rates. Now, the typical of this was, and this is, fair, this is an example. Uh, you and I might be uh, living in, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, as this, uh, this began. We picked up the Milwaukee Journal, and here's a, an ad for, the, for this, for the Chautauqua. Basically, it would say, we will, give, we will sell you your round-trip rail fare, uh, uh, overnight accommodations in rail car, Pullman cars on the site, admission to all of the events, all this for $12 or $13. And of course, people came. And the, the show that they put on at Chautauqua was wonderful. And of course, it did attract people. And step by step, one by one, people began to arrive here. Now, in addition to that, of course, they began to put together other little, uh, what we would call farm to market villages. And this is, most of these uh, incidentally were named after Chipley's uh, lieutenants. These were, you find Carryville and, and uh, uh, Chipley and Bonifay and the, all of these were uh, railroad officials. And if you take a look at the, the mileage, it's kind of interesting because those villages were spaced out of, oh, roughly 50 to 100 miles apart. And basically they were necessary because the railroad engines, of course, had to had to rewater uh, periodically as they made their move back and forth, and so uh, the uh, Chipley and Bonifay and the other place were watering centers for the railroad engines, and they became farm to market villages as well. And all of this, of course, is part of the work that Chipley did. Well, now as he continued his work with the railroad. <clears throat> Chipley also became very much interested in local government because he recognized that uh, as a railroad leader, he had to be able to get certain things done by the county and of course by the, uh, by the city itself. And so when it, we came to 1885, Chipley was one of those who encouraged local businessmen to, to petition the legislature to change our form of government. Uh, up from that point, from the beginning of, t of the uh, of Pensacola in the United States, in the era beginning in 1821, we had had an, a, a, uh, alderman, a, city, a, a city council of aldermen with a mayor. And that's the way things had operated up to 1885. Chipley and some others said, this is too slow, too deliberate, These, we're not getting things done. And they petitioned to change 
changed the system to a commission system with a much smaller number of people and where the, the commissioners themselves would have a great deal more individual power. And this passed on, and Chipley, of course, almost at once became a, a commissioner. He was elected a commissioner, and he was put in charge of public safety. And it was Chipley that literally re remade all of our police and fire protection uh, for this community and instituted a lot of other, a lot of, a lot of other uh, uh, activities and, 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 and uh, progressive things that were needed. Uh, the, the city, of course, in, in this time now put through its first sewer system uh, as a complement to the private water system. And things of that kind were, were being pushed by, by Chipley. Well, as Chipley worked, of course, he was identified with the railroad. And at this point in time, a new newspaper arrived here, was put in place here, uh, called The Commercial. It was, it was operated, uh, owned and operated by a man named Dennis Wolf. And Mrs., Mr. Wolf looked upon Chipley as some sort of a, oh, uh, uh, an ogre. He said he was, a, he was a, a manipulator. He's using his power as a railroad man to do things that should not be. And so the, the editorials uh, in, the, in the commercial were very, very unpleasant to Mr. Chipley. So by the time we reached the, the end of the 1880s, Mr. Chipley formed. A, a, an alliance with one of his associates, Richard Carey, and another newspaper man named O'Connor, and they created still a new newspaper, which became known as the Pensacola News. And of course, it was the editorial opposite of what was being done in the commercial. The, the news backed and supported and, and editorially praised the things that Chipley was doing, while Dennis Wolf and the news and the commercial did not. Well, we moved into the early part of the 1890s, and Chipley's, Chipley's work in the community had, had been, I think, I think the proper word would be respected because the railroad was doing many wonderful things. Chipley was a visionary. He, was, he could see that in his own mind that Pensacola Port was going to become a major factor in the economy of the country. He believed, as others did at that time, that, the country, that our country was going to engineer a canal across, an inter-ocean canal across Nicaragua. And so Mr. Chipley went to New York, got the Ellen and Railroad officials to set aside considerable sums of money <clears throat> to build a better port down right on the docks here and also to build such things as a coal tipple for, uh, in, for uh, coal exports and also a grain elevator to, uh, to help uh, sustain and improve our, our exports in agriculture. All of these things were the product of William Chipley's genius. Well, he went to, uh, he, wanted, he wanted to go further. He could see that the next step for uh, helping the community and also for uh, for uh, helping his, his company, the railroad, was to become a United States senator. Now, in these days, of course, the, the United States senators were chosen not popularly, but by the state legislatures. And so Mr. Chipley became a candidate for the Senate in 1896. He was opposed by a local man with a very prominent name. He was Stephen Russell Mallory, Jr., the, uh, the son of the man who had been our Confederate Secretary of the Navy. They were both see seeking to unseat the the Senator Call, who had become a rather unpopular man at that time. So the, the, it was just a hotly contested uh, affair, and the, it took a, a great many ballots before, uh, with a considerable amount of shifting back and forth, and uh, uh, what some people said was a, a little uh, political hanky-panky. Nonetheless, Mr. Mallory was elected senator. And Mr. Chipley, the story goes, he, as he returned home that night from Tallahassee on his private car, the train was met at the, at the depot by uh, local citizens who literally took him, escorted him to a carriage that had no horses on it, and local citizens pulled that carriage through the streets to his to Chipley's home saying, look, we recognize what you have done and we just wanted to tell you we support you all the way. Well, less than six months later, Chipley was in Washington on business for the railroad and as he came out of the, uh, the Department of Commerce building, he clutched his chest, he stumbled, fell, and was dead of a heart attack. And so Chipley was lost to us. Well, if you go downtown today into Plaza Ferdinand, you will see about a 30 foot tall obelisk, which on its base has a small tablet and a small bust of William Dudley Chipley, who is the only man, only civilian to which the Pensacola com uh, community has made such a, uh, a contribution. He is our only member, our only citizen to remember that way.